So we're going to have a session of brief reminiscences now, and I would like to ask the speakers to come forward and, and talk. So specifically, I'm looking for Neil Lawrence, and we're going to do this with a handheld mic. So if you switch it on and start talking for about five minutes. Okay, great. Thanks, Christian, <laughs> and thanks for the invite. So. Um, so I moved to Cambridge Computer Lab in about January 1998 to do my PhD in machine learning. Um, in those days, there was very little machine learning in the computer lab. In fact, when I would leave the new museum site, I think there was no machine learning in the computer lab. It was nice to hear from Andy Hopper earlier that they've progressed on to not running over leading figures in uh, the computer lab when they cycle past. Um, I'm not sure that's as much progress as I'd want. Um, anyway. I used to head out to uh, David's inference group uh, uh, in order to sort of get my intellectual stimulation. So I kind of became an adoptee of David's group. Um, I'd cycle out from the new, new museum site to the Cavendish lab, and I'd listen to talks on belief propagation, independent component analysis, and low-density parity check codes. On occasion, well, I'm not so sure what I'm saying on occasion, because I know precisely how many occasions. Um, twice, I also spoke myself. So David's clarity of thought is unmatched by any other person I know. It is combined with a kindness and a depth of humanity that I think we have all experienced. However, when presenting to David, you are mainly subjected to his clarity of thought. <laughs> <laughs> There's one aspect, it's not my notes actually, I always remember to those presentations, most people presenting in those group meetings would present precisely to David, pretty much like this. And you would all sit around there as they tried to communicate their idea to David. Um, it was great. Um, <laughs> So my first presentation involved a lower bound on the mutual information of a mixture distribution. And midway through my talk, David said, I think that bound is only going to be tight when the components are far apart, and you need it to be tight when they are close together. And because it isn't, it's not going to be useful. <laughs> so what I remember about that is that it actually took me about four weeks to understand the question, <laughs> and another four weeks to work out that his guess was wrong. <laughs> It was only wrong because it was a Tommy Yakula bound, and Tommy's another of the most intelligent people I know. However, that question was the key question I should have been asking myself. It was an extremely important lesson and one that stayed with me. David really has a knack of getting right to the core of the issue, and uh, sort of comments like that made one realize what you had to do in order to work in research. So the second time I spoke, I was very excited because this time I developed a method for learning the number of hidden units in the hidden layer of a neural network. The approach was inspired by David's own work on automatic relevance determination, and David had also previously written that learning the number of nodes in a neural network was one of the outstanding challenges of neural nets. Again, about midway through the talk, David interrupted. He said, uh, you're doing the wrong thing here. Um, you shouldn't be looking for the number of hidden units. There should be an infinite number, and you should use them all. Slightly perturbed, I said, uh, but in this paper, you said that finding the number of hidden <laughs> nodes was one of the main outstanding challenges of neural networks. David replied, well, I used to think that, but now I don't. <laughs> It sounds silly, but that's the first time I realized that you were actually allowed to change your mind when you were doing something in research. That discussion with David was also a major influence on me switching focus to Gaussian process models, a focus I've retained for the last 15 years. I'm looking forward to dinner tonight when David tells me he's changed his mind again. <laughs> A later academic memory of David was from the Gaussian Process and Practice workshop we organized in 2006 at Bletchley Park. David kicked off the workshop with his talk, Gaussian Process Basics. Um, you can still view the video lecture today. Later, though, uh, Tony Sale kindly gave us a demonstration of his reconstruction of Colossus, the Tommy Flowers design decoding system for the German High Command's codes. Watching David watch that demonstration was like seeing history in the present, his mind querying the design of the machine that minds like his had made. Throughout Tony's demo, I had half an eye on the whirling tapes of the machine and another half on the whirling gears of David's mind. When I started in the field, David was the torch by which a very large section of the UK machine learning community was guided. But he has changed his focus to other areas, and his thoughts shine just as brightly there. Gallagher codes, human-computer interfaces, and most impressively, his change of focus to energy. 
It was a great pleasure for me that my own dad, in his retirement, was able to find as much inspiration in David's work as I had. He read David's book on sustainable energy and devoted himself to renewable energy at his local church, using the book as his guide. David has an urgent desire to do the right thing in all aspects of his life. As a result, in questions of both research and life, I still consult my mental model of David for advice. I'm not one for bumper stickers, but if I were, then my one would say, what would David do? <laughs> I know I could never emulate all his thoughts and opinions, but through the conversations I've had with him, I've developed an approximation that I hope steers me in the right direction. John Skilling. No, John Blythe. Ah. John Skilling. John Skilling is first. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> John Skilling. Well, excuse me, guys. Uh, as you can see from my uh, hairstyle, I've been around forever, even predating David here. And I first, well, I, was, I was in DMTP teaching mathematics and getting on with Steve Gull in maximum entropy data analysis. This was way, way, way back in the 1970s. And I remember David coming in as a, a very bright, obviously very bright young student with a remarkable gift for communication. This was exhilarating, even scary. It was it seemed to me that you know, ideas would come in, people would talk to David, and then they would go out again, sort of fountain of ideas. We weren't quite on parallel paths. Uh, I was getting involved with data reconstruction, very um, practical things with Steve Gull, and David had this rather strange idea about neural nets. And we wanted to be Bayesian, which we nearly were. And David wanted to be Bayesian too. And eventually became uh, Bayesian, got this thing in a proper format that we could understand. It's perhaps one of my regrets in life that I didn't follow that route more precisely and more clearly. It looked at the very beginning as if nets were tools looking for an application. And I myself didn't see what the applications would be, and I had my own trajectory, so I just got on with that. But we stayed in touch, uh, respected each other, and we even had a little note together on programming a digital form of slice sampling, which was rather nice. That was when nested sampling algorithm was coming up. David wanted to call it onion sampling, because one of the things that I remember is that he likes onions. <laughs> anyway, he went off to London, and at that stage, I have to confess, we largely lost touch, because he was clearly important and doing important things uh, for government, which were way over my head. Hasn't been my style. I lack his gifts for communication. Latterly, of course, as we all know, we have news of his illness, which we have received with deep shock. It is deeply unfair that younger colleagues should be afflicted. And yet, his blog is suffused with pragmatism and realism. It's quite remarkable. Now, I've had a brush with mortality myself last year, which gives me a bit of perspective. And I expect that David is reflecting on his life. Now, has it been worthwhile? Yes! <laughs> I have... Thank you. I have felt since boyhood that science is an ennobling activity. 
perhaps the most important that there is. We in science are enabling and building the future, and this gives huge personal satisfaction. I know for myself, I've made mistakes in life and in science, but I've tried to use my gifts as well as I could. David here has wider and deeper gifts than mine, perhaps wider and deeper than any of us in this room, and he's used them better than I. And although there is serious injustice in his situation now, I envisage and hope, David, that you look back to a life lived usefully and well. The world has noticed Professor Sir David Mackay, FRS, and I would add my might of appreciation for that. You have been inspirational and continue to be inspirational on several levels, and I respect and honor that, and I wish you very well indeed. Thank you. I didn't introduce you. <laughs> no. Wait okay, thank you. So, <laughs> John Bridal. <laughs> thank you. I've decided to give you just a few reminiscences about my uh, about the early years of David's academic career when I knew him first. I've probably known him for longer than most people here. Um, it I first met David when he was an undergraduate. Uh, and I was uh, in Malvern at RSRE, then a prestigious government research establishment. Um, and we found ourselves in adjacent buildings. And somehow we bumped into each other uh, in that funny old place. And we found all sorts of things to talk about, and, uh, um, including um, the, the work of um, David's father, Donald who was one of the pioneers of British cybernetics. Um, uh, but it, it was near the end of, of David's, uh, well, what we call internship now, I suppose, summer student. Um, but uh, the following year, the, the following summer, David returned to RSRE and worked with me um, applying the latest uh, fancy idea, which was backpropagation MLPs, um, to uh, speech synthesis. Basically, we were um, re-implementing Terry Sanofsky's net talk, um, but David added uh, an extra of uh, recurrent connections, uh, I guess we would say these days, a sort of recurrence, which um, I think improved things some, somewhat. Um, uh, David went off to Caltech to do a PhD under John Hopfield, as I'm sure you know, um, that uh, he sent me news of his, of his adventures there. It was in the early days of email, I suppose, but we, we had a good connection at RSRE. Um, and uh, I would get uh, all these interesting emails. Uh, I, I remember a couple of, of um, titles, at least, um, uh, that stuck in the memory. One was, Why I Am No Longer a Fundamentalist Bayesian. Um, this didn't mean he wasn't a Bayesian, of course. And it just wasn't a what he regarded as a fundamentalist Bayesian. And uh, that was a pretty scary thing, I guess. Um, and the, o the other one I remember was, um, I have become a biologist. Um, uh, and he, that was when he was embarking on a study of the development of fly brains. Um, and the other thing I rem re thought re worth remembering remarking on was uh, that I know David was pleased with the success of his campaign to get Caltech to turn off the lights at night to save energy. And, and we know where that interest led. Um, if I could turn to a sort of personal note, uh, D David returned to Cambridge, of course, after that as a fellow at Darwin 
and, and we kept in touch. Um, when my daughter Sarah was considering applying to universities, David kindly offered to show us around Cambridge. Um, and I, I like to think that it was during a trip along the backs in a Darwin punt that Sarah decided that Cambridge was the place to aim at. Her PhD in, in, at Cambridge was on Bayesian methods in cosmology and was heavily influenced by David. I have checked this paragraph with my daughter, who's sitting at the back. <laughs> um, so, uh, somewhat, um, when I heard that David had been knighted, um, I have to say, my, my thoughts would turn to fairy tales and, and to chess. Um, <laughs> perhaps, bec perhaps because of the way that he had the courage to fight the dragons of ignorance, waste, and injustice. Um, and also the way his career moved, not in conventional straight lines, but with, in dramatic sidesteps. Um, now, I've been working in automatic speech recognition, more or less, since I graduated, which incidentally was the year that David was born. So I have a special admiration for anyone who can contribute at a high level in so many fields. Um, and I suppose, as David says, everything is connected. And finally, we have Graham. Um. Lovely, yes, I've got a good thing. Although, actually, uh, am I, am I, is it working? Yes. Now, how do I get? Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Very good. So, um, I apologize for more slides. So I'm going to go, go through them very quickly. So, I'm not going to, to exceed my, my five minutes. Um, so, everyone has um, remarked how David has unbelievable range of things from physics, information theory, biology, neuroscience, and, and um, but there was one thing which he, he had to, um, an arrow he had to add to his quiver, which was um, the quantum world. And um, uh, we worked together um, with, oh, how does it, um, mm -hmm. let's see. I going to move forward. Oh, okay. Now it works. Great, 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 great. Uh, ah, uh, um, mm -mm. okay. It seems to have disappeared for some reason. Well, we in in, in two thousand and three, I think we 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 produced um, a paper with uh, Paul McFadden, who was uh, um, an undergraduate at the time, on on quantum codes. And so I thought I'd just say a little bit about what quantum codes are, because um, they, they sound rather airy-fairy, and in fact, they have a very important practical meaning. So um, the, um, oh, sorry, this is very randomized. Um, oh, there's our paper, there's our paper. Okay, okay, and, um, and the uh, sort of c cartoon depiction of the world of quantum computing um, makes it look very like classical computing. You have a, um, a, a circuit diagram and you feed in spins, which can be up or down, so they're a little bit like um, classical bits. Um, and, and you get a result at the end, which um, is the answer to your computation. Uh, but there's one big um, difference, which is that spins can in fact point in any direction. And so this raises the question of whether you're letting yourself into the world of analog computation. And um, analog computing has a unhappy um, association. Um, 
the world's analogue computers can be found in museums mostly and in the Science Museum in South Kensington. There are some wonderful machines, including this extraordinary thing which, which calculated uh, the British economy uh, and gave a new meaning to liquidity because everything was done with, with coloured water. And, and you could sort of measure the national debt in a bucket. Um, <laughs> uh, so, um, is the quantum computer destined to end up in the, um, uh, uh, the Science Museum? And the, the answer is no, because amazingly, uh, in 1995, um, the first example of a quantum code was discovered. And you can correct the errors, even though it's, in a sense, a continuous, it has a continuous state space. You can correct errors, and, um, and that opens the, the way to making real, to doing real computations. And uh, it, uh, here's an example of a code, but the question that David asked is, can you import the machinery which he'd made work so wonderfully? So you have um, low-density parity check codes uh, in, in the classical world. Can you do something like that in, in the quantum uh, realm? And that's what we looked at. Um, and um, uh, here is a, um, a, a sample of something, of a message that uh, David sent me. Um, uh, I should say all the codes that in, in the paper were discovered by David um, over my kitchen table, uh, although this one re refers to a little cycle trip we took. And at the end of it, out came the idea of these bicyclic codes, and they've taken off. I mean, the idea uh, essentially has been taken up by people and has been used creatively. So, so this is a very uh, s significant little foray into the world, into the quantum world, David. Uh, um, very successful, much more successful than anything else I've ever done in the quantum world. And um, I should say, my role, my role was was being the cook. So. David and Paul would arrive, they would sit down, David would start writing, absorbed in his ideas, and um, I would kind of get things going on, on, on the stove. And every now and then, um, uh, my ambitions were frustrated, and um, I, I'm afraid this never got eaten. Um, this was a, a, a Romanesco uh, cauliflower, and David noticed the wonderful fractal pattern. It's an amazing thing. It's a kind of philotactic uh, object of great beauty. And um, insisted that I get out my paint box. And um, uh, I'm afraid uh, it never got cooked. But um, anyway, it's a, kind of si it's a kind of symbol of um, the surprises along the way when one's working with David. And I, I, it's, it's been an extraordinary experience, a wonderful experience to, uh, uh, um, to do this particular project with him. And I just wanted to say, David, thank you very much for the um, joy you've given the people you've worked with. So thank you to all the speakers um, for a really exciting um, morning. Um, there's one thing that um, I'd like to remind people of. We have a memory book for David, and it's where you picked up your name badges. So if you have memories you'd like to write down, um, or if you have photos or things you'd like to include, please, please go and add them. Um, we'd be very happy to have your contributions. And now lunch is going to be served, and I hope you're hungry. Thank you. <laughs>